What we're doing today is I want to uh, discuss and introduce uh, uh, a proposal, uh, as Brad mentioned, um, where swine producers in Minnesota have the opportunity to partner with the Board of Animal Health with the intent of improving the value of Minnesota PERS and PED in Minnesota. Uh, I'm going to kind of take you through the process that went through and the discussions that took place as we uh, arrived at this proposal. And uh, so I'm going to make some initial uh, comments to, to kind of lead you through the discussion and what the, how this came to be. And then we'll have a few comments from Bill, from, uh, who's representing the Board of Animal Health. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll have an open forum for question and answers. So I, I'm going to take you through this, and, and we're going to begin with a review and progress report of what's next. Um, the, this whole process uh, began uh, about mid-January mid or mid-July. And uh, I'll take you through the process that, uh, that led to this consideration. So it began in uh, our regional meetings. We, uh, I'm the coordinator for the North 212 PERS and PED e e uh, elimination project. And uh, so as coordinator, we have, we schedule meetings that are uh, quarterly in Prinsburg and Morris, which is uh, two centrally located areas for that part of the state. And uh, we've been uh, doing this since 2004. I've uh, started the project or became involved with it in 2010. So it's been going on quite some time. And at these meetings, uh, we presented the thing, the, the question, have we reached the tipping point? And, uh, you know, a big concern, we've been attempting to uh, manage these things with arc &E projects and uh, the regional control uh, mandates. and. Uh, there's been a, a certain amount of frustration, of course, because we still uh, haven't quite gotten a handle on this. And so the question that, uh, that we pose to the group, to, the, to these uh, producers and veterinarians who are in attendance, is have we reached the tipping point? Uh, is there something more that we need to do? What's next? And uh, we discussed some of the options and limitations of, that were available to us. And uh, from the producer feedback and the veterinary feedback that we got from those meetings, the consensus was is that there indeed was enough interest to explore some other, uh, other options. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this on paper, things look, uh, things look pretty good. Uh, this is our uh, progress report for the North 212. And as you can see, we've got a little over 900 sites that are identified. Uh, 111 of them are, are empty, but they are sites that are, are identified as having had pigs. We've got about 600 signed participants. And if you look at the trend there, uh, the number of positive sites has reduced. Uh, we've got more stable vaccinates. Uh, the negative sites has increased. And, um, uh, we, but we still have uh, about 300 uh, unknown uh, sites that, that we've got going on there. So if you look at this on paper, it looks pretty darn good. I mean, you can pat yourself in the back. We're making some progress. The problem came um, for our area in particular uh, at the end of uh, this spring, late, uh, late in the spring, it just so happens if you look at the far side of the right, uh, we passed uh, the epidemic threshold, which is what that red line is. And it just so happened that the North 212 area, our, our system, group of, of systems, was the only one in the country that broke the threshold of new PERS incidence cases. So this was problematic. So I went back and looked at this uh, uh, um, compose this epidemic curve. And as you can see, uh, I, as I mentioned, I started, I took over the project in uh, late 2010. And uh, the project was begun in 2004. Uh, Spencer Wayne, who's a veterinarian with Pipestone now, began uh, some of the projects. Cesar Corzo uh, carried it on. And then I became the coordinator in 2010. Well, <clears throat> uh, if you look, those Early, early places that we got. I don't have a pointer, so I'll just uh, step down here. Uh, this was a, a great time to be a part of it because it looked like, boy, we didn't have much going on. Then we had a little bit of a blip here, but there were very few clinical signs that we had going on. Uh, got that under control. And then things looked pretty good here. And then all of a sudden, in late uh, 2012, 2013, we had just a heck of an outbreak um, that was very devastating uh, up in the Stevens County area. Um, the, the red is the sow units and the blue are the, are the units, the, the downstream finishing units. 
And we figured there were probably about $5 million loss in that one area from that series. Well, we got that under control, and then we had some small outbreaks with 144. Uh, it had a little bit of a bump up here. But this is where we had the, uh, uh, where we crossed the epidemic threshold last spring. And uh, that was the concern. Uh, and uh, so we wonder, well, are, are we frustrated enough that we need to do something else? So what we did then is we, uh, we invited an open meeting from uh, producers and veterinarians who were interested. And uh, we met in Wilmer in late August to try to uh, figure out, well, what could we do? What's possible? Uh, myself, Roger Kuzman, Beth Thompson from the board, Montsitori Morell from the uh, U, Nate Winkleman's a veterinarian, Sarah Sheik is an extension. We had uh, some producers, uh, John Schwartz, or John Anderson, Mark Schwartz, Tim Snyder's a veterinarian, Dave Preisler was there, uh, Deb Murray's a veterinarian, and then we had a couple of other people who weren't able to make it, Steve Langhorst and Randy Kale. So, uh, but they were involved in the process. So we were trying to get people uh, from within uh, the, the swine community uh, who had a fair amount of credibility and uh, would offer uh, us some pretty good advice as to what we might do. So the meeting goal there on the 23rd was to explore feasible options to improve PERS and PD control in, in uh, Minnesota. Now, at our meeting when we started in, uh, uh, in the regional meetings, we felt it was certainly not a mandate to act, but it was a mandate to explore. So this is the exploration process that we're going on. So at that meeting, we, uh, we found that there were a number of limitations that we had to, uh, we had to deal with if we're going to try to make uh, progress with this, uh, this whole business. First of all, PERS and PED uh, control is voluntary and remains the responsibility of the swine industry. Um, these two diseases are not going to be uh, taken over or uh, there's going to be no help from the federal government on, on these types of, of programs. Uh, one, because uh, they don't uh, have any human health impact. And second of all, they don't impact exports. So in contrast to the high path avian influenza where the federal government jumped right in, um, this is our baby. We are, uh, as an industry, we are responsible for managing and controlling our own destiny. So it's going to remain voluntary. So that's, that's the first limitation of whatever we do. Second of all, uh, we cannot split the state. Um, I'm from the North 212 project, and uh, of course that means uh, well, people would say, well, why don't we just control or see if we can't separate the state like we did for pseudorabies or, or, uh, or tuberculosis and try it in the northern part of the state. We can't do that, or there's no precedent for doing it uh, in, the, in, in the state without federal involvement. Once again, as I mentioned, federal government's not going to be involved, so we really can't do that. There's no, no way to, to, to manage it. So that means we have to... Uh, invite, persuade, uh, involve the entire state. And that's you know, where we are right, right now. Uh, third, we must accommodate diverse opinions. As, uh, as you might expect, there are all kinds of perspectives on this. On, on the one hand, there are groups that say, we need to know uh, every um, pig movement. We need to know what the sequence is of, of every virus. If, if we don't, we're, we're going to get nowhere. On the other hand, if we ask for all that and command that, there's a whole lot of paperwork. There's people are going to say, people are just going to hide out. They're not going to become involved. They're going to be um, more irritated with the system. We just, uh, we have to take a more passive uh, response to this. So many diverse uh, opinions, as you might expect. Uh, we can't have any movement restrictions. Right now, there's a million pigs on uh, United States highways every day, and uh, we certainly can't restrict movement coming into the into the state or, or movement even uh, within the state. So, so that's a limitation for PERS and PED control. And finally, we have to limit cost and inconvenience. I'm a veterinarian. I write health certificates uh, regularly, and most people find that's a pain in the butt. But uh, we, we really have to figure out a way to accommodate it without too much inconvenience and, and not much cost. I, when, I, when I took the project or when I took on the responsibility as coordinator, I thought, well, this is kind of like being on the Board of Animal Health, but uh, you have no power and you have no budget. So it's a great system, you know. 
So we're, we're out here trying to uh, motivate people to participate uh, voluntarily and work with, uh, with a very uh, modest budget. So these are the limitations. So we, uh, we got together, we collected our thoughts, and uh, we put together the structure uh, that's very similar to what you have found on the handout that's back there. This is, this is the core um, process, and if you haven't picked one of those up, uh, you ought to probably have one of those for, for later in the meeting for reference. So uh, we took this general concept, and we went to, I was the representative of the group, and we presented this to the Minnesota Pork Board Executive Committee, and we summarized the discussion from these previous meetings. So at that meeting, the general concept was presented. We explained the history similar to what I've done here. Uh, we offered this particular suggestion in very general uh, format as a, a constructive progress in a producer-led program. And uh, I, we didn't really have an agenda there to expect uh, a response from them, but it was mainly to make the uh, executive committee aware that this was going on and to get some feedback and to find out how it was going on. So <clears throat> we had good discussion, but no action was requested or taken. So, but out of that, after we got their feedback, there are two documents that were drafted. And the, uh, the first one is filling, filling finishing barns uh, responsibly that uh, you have as uh, one of those uh, first sheets. <clears throat> that was a pretty non-controversial uh, concept, but basically it offers uh, the regional control uh, programs to assist people in, finish, in filling finishing barns with pigs that are appropriately uh, appropriate to their disease status in that area. And if we can help find them some negative pigs, if that's what they want, uh, we can help do that. Uh, second of all, uh, then we put this uh, partnership proposal with the Board of Animal Health. And uh, uh, we sent out the question and answer, and uh, we put those two documents together. And that's basically what you have in front of you this morning. So um, we took that, those documents, we distributed it to the uh, Minnesota Swine Health Task Force. And this was all uh, pretty much under the guidance and direction of Dave Preissler. We wanted to move this through diplomatic channels and take the appropriate steps. Uh, nobody likes to be told what to do. So we want to invite participation uh, in each step of the way. So I went to the Swine Health Task Force, and we met on November 18th in, Moca in Mankato, so it was just uh, not that long ago, and uh, made the presentation there. So the background, again, for this, uh, PERS and PED continue to plague the Minnesota swine industry despite <clears throat> a reduced prevalence nationwide. Uh, I just read that 40% uh, of the breeding herds um, have been infected or continue to be infected, so that's the national incidence. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, 60% are not, but 40% is still pretty significant. So it's, it's a big deal, and as you could see from the, the epidemic curve that I presented earlier, it's certainly still an issue for our North 212 area. Uh, 15 million pigs are finished in Minnesota, and we've collected some, uh, some numbers. And there's six and a half million of those pigs that move into Minnesota from other states, and an additional million pigs come into Canada. So more than half of these pigs that are finished in, uh, in Minnesota uh, are coming in from other states. I thought this was an interesting graphic. Uh, this slide is a little bit old, but it tells you where these pigs are coming from. And basically, Minnesota is a collecting ground for pigs from basically all over the country and from Canada. So we have a lot of pigs moving into the state and it's uh, quite a diverse uh, state of origin that, that we've got here. We also pointed out at this meeting uh, to the task force that these regional control projects have been helpful in promoting collaboration uh, among producers and veterinarians, but the effectiveness is limited by the voluntary nature of the program. Um, it, it's been interesting to, for me to look at this project as we've gone along and uh, we've really attempted to promote transparency among the industry and uh, when you're sharing disease status with one another, uh, it's a big deal. And, uh, and part of our goal is not only to encourage producers to share their information with one another, but also to use the uh, information that's gathered with a tremendous amount of respect and discretion. 
Uh, if somebody finds out that uh, your neighbor is positive, the, the last thing you want to do is uh, go out and, and blame them for bringing it into the area or uh, have the social implications of not shaking somebody's hand at church. You know, it's, it's uh, one of those things that, that part of it is an educational effort. And I think that we have really made uh, quite a significant change in, uh, in the five years I've been involved with it and with the disease in general. People understand that um, uh, Paul Sundberg had uh, coined the phrase, I think, that we have a national herd now. We don't have just <clears throat> localized herds. And the diseases that we're challenged with uh, really um, are not something that we can manage on our own. What happens to our neighbors really impacts what happens to us. So it behooves us as an industry to remain transparent and open. But this is really contrary to our, uh, our attitudes and our general beliefs. So uh, we have to keep this in mind. I think there's progress, but that's, that's one of the things that we talked about. So the limitations of voluntary programs. There's usually not 100% participation. That we could have pretty well predicted. Uh, not all participants test and uh, report status changes regularly, particularly among independent finishers and small producers. Um, <clears throat> our North 212 project is called System 22 in our uh, National Incidence and Prevalence Project. And I send out an email weekly to a group of people, and we probably have uh, 35, uh, 40 sow herds. And uh, these respondents come back to me very regularly. We get a good response from sow herds as to any change in status. And uh, for the people that are participating here, I, I want to express my appreciation to that because that helps us collect information. It does really, really well. And a lot of these herds test regularly. They report regularly. They know what's going on with their herds, and that's spectacular. But we don't hear very regularly from finishing herds that are filling their barns regularly. Many of them to don't test, and many of them don't report. And <clears throat> I just don't have the capability with uh, 800 sites to track them down. So we're, we're relying on that. A perceived lack of progress frustrates producer and leads to a further lack of participation. Um, as I mentioned, this program began in 2004, and we've got producers who have been actively engaged in this uh, program for uh, now, what, 11? Is that the math? 12 years? And uh, if, if we don't see some steady progress that, uh, that is made, uh, these people are going to start to lose hope. They're going to lose confidence in the project, and, uh, and they get frustrated. So that brings us back to, have we reached a tipping point? And uh, so, so I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, I was at a meeting in Chicago uh, just uh, in December, and uh, they had a number of coordinators from other regional control projects, and one of the big challenges is always to maintain producer interest. You know, they have the regional meetings, got to get people to attend, and we've been fortunate. Our, our attendance continues to go. We've been really fortunate to have really uh, good speakers who uh, volunteer their time, and that continues to, to keep people interested. But it would be really nice to see some concrete progress as well. And with voluntary programs, we don't know the status of non-participating herds, nor of pigs coming into Minnesota. And uh, so these are, these are big issues to understanding the disease and trying to get a handle on it. So the purpose of the proposal then. Uh, the proposal basically, we want to partner with the Minnesota Board of Animal Health to gather information about PERS and PED status of pigs entering Minnesota that could lead to a better understanding of the dynamics of disease control. So as you see there, I was pretty careful not to point out that we're going to go out and cure this thing, but we want to better understand it. Uh, typically, if we can't uh, eliminate something on a disease standpoint, perhaps we can better understand it. And if we better understand it, we're a step closer to, to getting to, to the solution. So um, furthermore, this, con this continues to uh, be a part of a voluntary program. The, uh, the Board of Animal Health, has, 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 as Bill is going to mention, has been very open to uh, cooperating with the swine industry um, in this project or in anything else that we might request of them. But they're not going to act unless we as an industry ask them to participate. So it's not a top-down imposition 
of government will on, on producers. It's just simply another opportunity for us to involve government as another key element for us to help understand the disease. So I think that's important for people who uh, have the, the, the whole premise that I don't want no government involved, you know, and, and I can understand that. That's, that's a common, uh, I think, perception. But <clears throat> when we invite people, when we invite the, the government to, to participate with us, it still puts it into the, into the voluntary realm. Uh, we hope that the information will determine area risk, just like we've been doing for our regional control programs, and also to assist in outbreak investigations. And again, uh, the whole idea is to limit inconvenience to producers and veterinarians, or the Board of Animal Health. So we don't want this to be a big uh, bureaucratic burden on anyone. So the proposal is what you have in front of us. Uh, we partner with the Board of Animal Health by asking them to request <clears throat> that certificates of veterinary inspection, which are the health certificates that already are required for all pigs entering Minnesota, include a statement that discloses the PERS and BED status of the herd of origin. Uh, if it is known, no restrictions would be placed on any pigs coming in. They could come in regardless of their status. Um, so that's, that's a part of it. So we're not stopping any pig movement. We're just asking for that information. <clears throat> in looking at this, I, I uh, just got the, uh, the 2015 summary. And uh, as you can imagine, with the number of pigs that we've got coming in, it, there's a lot of health certificates. <clears throat> so there's 7,641 CVIs that uh, came in. And this includes about a little over 6 million pigs. That includes a million imports from Canada. And uh, there's an additional 1.5 million pigs that uh, are reported uh, with what's called the system spreadsheet uh, with producers, big companies primarily, that have a swine health production plan. And that's compiled weekly by the board. I went in and visited with uh, Beth at the board uh, uh, just before Christmas. And I was actually quite surprised to learn that there's a variety of formats that are accepted by the board um, at, that are qualify as a as a valid uh, certificate of veterinary inspection or health certificate. We got the federal electronic ones, uh, the VSPS. We got private electronic ones that primarily is Global Vet Link. And then we have paper certificates and a variety of other private electronic formats. And then finally, the system spreadsheets. <clears throat> so all of these have uh, a, a kind of a diverse uh, format that's laid out. So it's not real simple to gather that information that that we're looking for. So the bottom line of this is uh, we're probably going to need to hire somebody. Uh, we're looking at a student position if, if this moves forward to extract the data that we need and to help report it. The board is very interested in uh, willing to help us, but they can't dedicate a tremendous amount of resources uh, to doing this. Uh, when we looked at these numbers and, and did some time studies, it looks like we could probably manage this in about five hours a week. So it's not going to be a huge thing. And if we can get a student who's well versed in, in uh, uh, some technology, some IT, uh, we think that we could manage that. It's going to take a little setup time, obviously, to gather this information. But the idea is to, to gather it probably with a student position. Uh, Dean Compart, uh, who is the, the chair of the board and registered uh, a concern that, that I think was, was valid, and it's one I hadn't thought of. Uh, the, the, both PERS and PED are not regulated diseases. So his concern was, are we going to be showing favoritism to the swine industry if we're willing to go ahead and do all this? Uh, we could have some other dog and cat disease that somebody, special interest group, could come in and ask us about. Um, and, and it really is outside of our realm. And uh, I think the, the issue there is resources, use of resources. And if we as an industry can provide uh, the assistance to uh, coordinate this so we don't have to impose financially on the board, they can then very easily defend this uh, situation to the taxpayers um, and not feel that they're obligated to other special interest groups to do that. So I think that's, uh, that's something that, that it was good that was pointed out as we're piecing this together. Most of the output we originally, or I was, uh, you know, when we put this thing together, <clears throat> the, uh, there's confidentiality issues 
that um, our restrictions about exactly what type of information can be released by the board to the public. And uh, they can't take this information and pinpoint it exactly to the location like we can when we report to our uh, North 212 project. We can actually get it down so that if there is a site positive, uh, you know the site, you know the name, you know a lot about it. But they don't have that luxury uh, within the, the confidentiality restrictions of the board. However, uh, it is legal and possible for them to put this into a bi-county group. And I thought, well, that would be a nice way to, to report so at least you have an, an idea of what general area these things are coming into. Uh, the problem is that on these certificates of veterinary inspection, uh, county of destination is generally not included. It's there on occasion, but it's not, not always. And so that means you'd have to cross-reference the, uh, the address of destination with the county. So then we started thinking, well, perhaps it would be better to use zip code of destination. And uh, Dr. Bill and checked it all out. That would also be legal. So if you just make a comparison here, this is the county area. These are the different zip codes with each of these areas are a different color. Now, that would still give us uh, a general area of what's happening to the different pigs, you know, or to the, to the incoming area without jeopardizing an exact location. And it would be a lot easier to summarize that. If you look at this, this is a little bit more of a detail. And uh, so, so in my mind, just to facilitate the process, I think this might be a more appropriate way to go. Then on the output, uh, the board would agree to allow us to post this on, on a weekly basis and update it. And uh, we'd have the date that the pigs uh, arrived or that the health certificate was processed, the state of origin, number of pigs, uh, whether these are feeders or breeders that are coming in, uh, and then this county or zip code of destination, and uh, then the PERS and PED status that, that would be coming in. And the idea then would be that somebody could, uh, a producer, a veterinarian, could just go into the, to the website, they could <clears throat> enter a date range and say, I want to know uh, what pigs entered this zip code from this date to this date, um, and tell me what the history of those pigs are. And with that information, we might be able to find out, are there new things that are, new activities that have been going on that I need to be aware of, and I should share this with my, with my uh, uh, colleagues or my, my clients? Or uh, is this something that I, would help me with an investigation? All of a sudden, I got a new uh, break, and it's a sequence I haven't seen before. Um, what, what, what pigs came into our area from out of state? So anyway, uh, the Swine Health Task Force listened to this uh, proposal, and uh, they thought that it had enough merit to present it to the pork producers for comment and feedback. <clears throat> so that's where we are today. Um, we uh, talked to Dave, and he said, well, uh, we got the Pork Congress coming up. This might be a good opportunity to, to present it to the producers and to engage in a discussion about it. Um, so we're looking for your feedback. Um, and uh, we'll, after, uh, after Bill has his comments, we'll entertain a question and answer session. Uh, if you're too timid here, you really despise this proposal, uh, I encourage you to contact your pork board. Don't call me. <laughs> you can call me if you got a question. But um, really, we, we want to, uh, uh, the big message is that we don't, uh, nobody wants to impose an idea on anyone, but we feel that this uh, might be a, a something that is would be a benefit to the, to the producers uh, and the swine producers in the state and uh, would give us some added information. So here's the, the summary of the value. First of all, to identify the PERS and PD status of seven and a half million pigs that are coming into Minnesota, to better understand the dynamics of uh, PERS and PD as it relates to pig movement uh, in the state, to assist in outbreak investigations, as I mentioned, to encourage vet-to-vet -vet communication, I have to. I have to tell a, a, a quick story. I, I did a little lobbying ahead of time, uh, trying to contact different uh, major pig producers and veterinarians who were involved with that, and I got a couple of stories. And one of them was that, uh, uh, matter of fact, two different veterinarians said, "You really can't believe what a broker tells you. Uh, you really have to contact the veterinarian." 
And uh, one, of the, one of the vets said, you know, we, uh, we had a, a PERS outbreak and uh, we had a, a nursery finishing unit that was positive and we needed to, um, we wanted to uh, empty this site. So we sold those pigs to a broker, you know, and emptied the site, cleaned it up so we can move in some other things. So then they needed to find some clean pigs. So they're looking around to, to find some clean pigs. They contacted another broker, said, yeah, I got some triple negative pigs here for you. Said, fine, bring them on in. They brought them all in uh, a few weeks later and they looked at them and said, geez, these, these things look pretty familiar and they're not, they're kind of sick. And, and when they finally did the investigation, they found out that they just paid a $5 premium for the same pigs they'd sold. So you, you really, uh, the vet to vet things, you know, I imagine there are veterinarians out there who are not totally honest. But generally speaking, if you ask them a question, they're going to tell you the answer, uh, I think. And, and I would encourage you to, to, to do this. And this might flush out uh, and encourage a little bit more of that kind of conversation. Finally, uh, to inspire more regional participation and transparency, which we talked about earlier. And ultimately, to reduce the PERS and PED infection rates which is uh, really a necessary component if we are going to become serious about reducing our antibiotic use. And that's a topic that I know is going to be on the, on the next session. And uh, it, it's one of those things that if, uh, if we're constantly dealing with PERS, we're going to constantly need antibiotics. And uh, if we're going to try to reduce it, if we can get a handle on this, it's going to help us a lot. And we think that this is uh, going to take a progressive step forward in PERS and PD control. Minnesota has uh, been a leader in PERS and PD control uh, over the course of, uh, of the time that this has been involved. And I, uh, I feel that this might be another, another step that we could uh, lead as an example uh, for the state in managing that. So this is the quote that uh, Peter Davies summarized. And uh, uh, Thomas Bayes was a, was a uh, theologian and a philosopher and a statistician who lived 300 years ago. And uh, fortunately, Peter uh, presented this uh, information in a, in a talk, and it got picked up by the, I saw it in the Pork uh, uh, Review, I think, or uh, just this past week. And it was also in a dairy magazine, so it must be true. Um, and, and he was fortunate enough to paraphrase it for us. Basically, it says, our prior probability or our prior belief or opinion always exist, but with new information, the belief or opinion is revised. So that's what uh, uh, Peter used it in explaining how we have revised our thinking on biosecurity when it comes to PED. And with this added information, I think we might have a better opportunity to uh, understand and change our behavior related to PERS and PED on a, on a local level. And if this is too deep for you, I really like Michael Murtaugh's comment that he made a few years ago. He's a virologist at the University of Minnesota. He said, it's always better to know than not to know. And uh, so if uh, that, that's a mantra from a research perspective, and uh, I think it might behoove us to, uh, to better understand that as well. So with that, we will, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bill, and then uh, we'll open this up for questions and discussion. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Hartman. I'm the executive director of the Board of Animal Health and the state veterinarian. Let's see. Can hear him back? You good? Okay, good. Okay. Um, we've always had at the Board of Animal Health a good relationship with the livestock and poultry industry in Minnesota. And as Dave said, this is a producer driven uh, proposal, not from the Board of Animal Health. <clears throat> I have been asking people in the swine industry for the last 10 years, is there any way we can help? But I think that's the key is we're here to help. We're not here to regulate. We're not here to uh, try and interfere in what your plans are. <clears throat> we have had similar programs to this in the past. We have uh, had a Yoni's disease program for many, many years, and it's, not, it's a non-regulatory program. It's just there to help dairy producers figure out how to minimize the impact of that disease. So um, we, we have experience in doing this sort of thing. Uh, we'll, we're fully supportive. Uh, Beth Thompson has been going to the meetings and briefing me on what uh, the proposal is going to be. 
Uh, she sends her uh, regrets that she couldn't make it here today, but uh, I'm here to replace her. Uh, we have a five member, for those of you who don't know the Board of Animal Health, we have a five member citizen board that are appointed by the governor. Uh, and Dean Compart is one of them. He's actually our president of the board right now. So if there's any concern that government is going to interfere in what you're doing, Dean won't let me. He will, uh, every spring he decides whether I, I'm in this job or not, and, and I'm sure if I wasn't doing it right, he wouldn't rehire me. Um, we are here to help in any way that we can. Uh, one of the things that Dave mentioned is that this information is protected. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but like seven, eight years ago, the livestock and poultry industry put together an initiative in the legislature to pass a bill that would protect names and addresses and animal IDs from the general public. That bill passed, it's a law now, so I can't give out your names and addresses uh, even if I wanted to. It's, it would be against the law. Now there are three exceptions to that rule. One is if it's for the animal health, one is if it's for public health, and one is if it's for law enforcement. So if, you, if there were an animal health reason to give out this information, uh, PERS or PED, we could do it, but only with your concurrence that we should do it. So um, I'm here to answer any questions and uh, look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Bill. So um, I guess at, at that point, we're, uh, uh, that's the formal presentation, and uh, you also have some uh, question and answers that uh, we attempted to to uh, anticipate that are uh, included in here. And some of them, uh, some of these questions were precipitated by a conversation that we've had throughout, uh, throughout this, the, uh, the time period. And, and as you can see, this uh, whole proposal has evolved over time. So I guess I, I'd entertain uh, questions from you. Or concerns, you know? Yes? Sure. Yeah, the question was, uh, Wisconsin has implemented a similar thing, and you're, you're absolutely right. They, uh, they have implemented a, a program, and it is very similar to this proposal. There is a requirement. They do have a requirement, and we're making a request. Um, but we're counting on people of, uh, you know, if you ask for the information, veterinarians are going to give it. I've got the detailed uh, information that, that was presented to me from Wisconsin. Now they only have 150,000 pigs that, that come in. And it was interesting, I, I talked to them when we first started mulling this over. And I talked to uh, both uh, people from the board and, and from the producer groups that uh, were involved with that. And it was interesting to me that the, the whole reason that they implemented this to begin with was as a producer educational effort. Uh, because a lot of small producers didn't even know what PERS was, you know, or PED. And, uh, and so they did it to, to try to, uh, to uh, educate producers as to what it is. And this would be part of the effort here, too. Uh, a lot of people probably never look at their CVIs when the pigs arrive and don't know anything about it. But this actually, uh, in addition to telling you something that, that you already know, which is the, the source of, of the pigs and the origin and how many and so on, it would tell you what the, what the disease status was. As far as uh, what progress has been made, um, I haven't analyzed this uh, excessively. Uh, they do have more people reporting. There's less unknowns than there were reported earlier. But as far as what's happened to the incidence and prevalence of, of the disease over that time, it's only a couple of years. I've got 2013, 2014 here, but I don't have the summary from 2015. Um, so I, you know, I think what, what's happened there is that it's increased the amount of reporting, but it may not have changed the, the, uh, uh, the impact. They might actually be considering trying to restrict move and entry, which is not something that we are at all considering. And you have to be, if you get a, if you get a rumor that, okay, Wisconsin's considering uh, not allowing positive pigs coming in, that is not at all uh, something that is even on the, the far horizon for this proposal. 
It's not a stepping stone to, to that kind of an area. Um, so uh, I can't answer your question as far as uh, what has been the, the result of it. But the other thing I can say um, is that when I looked at their, uh, their project, uh, I think they didn't use the information as well as they might have. Um, we intend to take this as a step further of making the output uh, available to producers on a regular basis with a, a hopefully a very timely turnaround. And uh, they, they basically just collected the information. And I don't think it's necessarily available unless a producer requests it. So it's a really good question, but uh, we're trying to build on the, on the basic concept that they've done. Other questions, comments, big concerns? Uh, you might want to uh, t take a look at, uh, at the question and answer uh, session that, or parts that we got there. That, that might prompt a, a little bit more discussion uh, or ask how we arrived at, at some of that. Um, oh, I, I know one of, the, one of the big things that, that I, I wanted to point out, there was a question that was asked um, presented to me, uh, you know, I called some of the veterinarians, particularly I wanted to contact people in the southern part of the state to get their, uh, their ideas on, on this and how it might be received because um, we've got, you know, kind of a northern Minnesota or above the northern two-thirds perspective and, I, you know, being that this is, uh, really has to be a, a Minnesota-driven thing and include all pork producers, I wanted to kind of get a handle on, on what the perception might be from people who, producers who were located in southern Minnesota, uh, particularly in, <clears throat> in areas that, and a good share of Minnesota is endemically infected with PERS, let's take, uh, for example. And uh, the question is, well, what's the value to people in southern Minnesota where uh, basically the advice from their veterinarians is that, well, you know, we've got it all around us, uh, we're gonna vaccinate and, uh, and try to filter everything that we can and uh, just manage it that way because it's just too overwhelming. So, so what's the value to us? Uh, particularly, and to be quite honest, um, if, if southern Minnesota becomes the dumping ground for northern Minnesota pigs that are positive. And uh, I can appreciate that, you know, because uh, there's a lot of pigs, just like with the pseudorabies effort, uh, moved to southern Minnesota and then to Iowa, and, you know, people down there got got those pigs and they're positive. And, and I can respect that, that this is not something that probably is um, on the short term gonna be a, a great big benefit because one of the things that we'd like to see is this, how is this gonna change our behavior? How is this gonna change our management if, uh, if we understand this and know this? Well, if you're endemic already, is that gonna change it? Perhaps not in the short term. But um, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, Part of the whole PERS uh, composition is that, at least it's my understanding from listening to people who know more than I do, uh, when you have a new uh, sequence coming into an area, uh, a different PERS virus, and you get a pig that's uh, infected with two different strains, that's when we get the greatest likelihood of recombination and yet another new sequence coming out. Um, when we deal with avian influenza, there is uh, a far higher situation of antigenic drift where there's recombination that even within one replication, there's, there's more problems with that. So uh, when, when we get new sequences coming in, that behooves us to, to, it causes a bigger problem for PERS. And of course, the latest one has been our 174 introduction. And uh, so, uh, you know, my, my response to that is, uh, wouldn't that be a benefit uh, to you to know what kind of things are coming into the area, even though you're endemic with other strains. Second of all, uh, there are a lot of uh, veterinarians, I was almost a little surprised to, to hear this, veterinarians and producers who simply don't want to vaccinate. <clears throat> they would much rather take the risk, live without vaccination, and we have a lot of negative pigs that are coming out of these uh, farrowing barns now and out of these uh, nurseries that are naive and negative. Well, we know, we, we understand how to get the negative pigs. And what are we gonna do with them? You know, are we just gonna 
uh, turn them over and vaccinate them and, and uh, take the risk of a new infection? Or can we have some safe harbor? Uh, we have pockets, certainly in northern Minnesota, that are remain negative, and we can still fill finishing barns with negative pigs safely. And, and it's actually moved down. There are, are people in Renville County who are doing the same thing, and that's right in an area. So uh, I think, you know, it's my perception anyway, and maybe that's limited, and, and uh, maybe it's too optimistic that there are going to be places that are going to, there's going to be a demand for safe harbor for non-vaccinated pigs. So that's my response to that uh, challenge, and, and I think it's legitimate. You know, I, I think uh, that's a, a big concern, particularly uh, when I'm up here basically trying to persuade southern Minnesota producers to adopt something that they may not see an immediate value to. Yeah. So, Dave, what are the next steps? How are you going to make the decision, and, and who's going to make the decision about whether to push this forward? Good point. Uh, next question, what, what are we going to do uh, if we move forward? And I haven't been able to, here's Dave Preisler. He's just stepped in. I was going to corner him before, before I came in to, to, to try to address this, this issue, and I'll have you respond to it after I do. But my suspicion is uh, that uh, the idea is to present this information, get this proposal out to the general uh, population of pig producers across the state, and then invite uh, feedback, uh, and, and the biggest feedback needs to be direct that I would expect to your Minnesota Pork Board and the Executive Committee, because that's where we started with the proposal, and uh, they're the ones that actually would have to, uh, I think, make a recommendation uh, that we uh, approach the Board of Animal Health. Uh, the, as I understand it, the next step is if they would, if, if producers in general would say, okay, I can live with this or I can agree to it, either way, um, and we think it might be a, a good move, then we would send a delegation uh, of producers and veterinarians to uh, make a, a pitch to the board and ask them for this, uh, to accommodate us on this, and if they said yes, we would then uh, implement the next step. Would that be an accurate assessment, Dave? I apologize for being here a little bit late. Uh, we had breakfast with our uh, my counterpart and some producers uh, from Manitoba, and uh, this was one of the topics we were talking about. And so, in fact, I've been talking with them over the last couple of months because we still bring in about a million pigs from Manitoba every year, and so we want to have this discussion with them too. Quite honestly, they didn't see it as a big deal from their standpoint. Um, they're a little bit should say ahead of us, but they're 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 better connected from a disease standpoint um, than I'd say that, that we probably are here. So but I'd say what you um, especially as you look at Western Canada, but anyway what you laid out I'd say was pretty accurate. You know, so this thing started again with a request from producers from uh, central and northern Minnesota, came to our board uh, they kind of punted it back to a swine health task force that we've got. They kind of said, you know what, let's get broader input from this. That's what we're doing this meeting today. And they'll come back to our board, and then uh, they'll make a decision, and then we'll sit down with the Board of Animal Health and, and we'll, You know, I think the good thing is that you know we've got a really good relationship with the Board of Animal Health. That, that's a good relationship going back and forth. And so um, I'd say what it really comes down to, board discussion we had is that we wanted to look what's right for producers, but just felt in this case we wanted to get a broader set of new input, get more discussion going about it, and that's really the purpose of today. Right, once again, uh, you know, nobody in my experience uh, likes to be told what to do. And, uh, you know, independent uh, pig farmers that I've worked with forever uh, uh, fall right into that category. And so I think that uh, the big message is that uh, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to go into partnership with the board in, in a way that could be beneficial. And uh, obviously I'm a, I'm a proponent and I encourage you to adopt it. But I, I really think you want to discuss it with your colleagues with your veterinarians, um, and and contact your uh, your board. I mean, uh, to to let them know how you feel about it. 
If you have strong feelings against doing it, you better let them know, uh, because otherwise they're going to just hear from uh, from me or somebody that might have a, a slanted perspective on the on the issue, and mine is obviously slanted. So uh, I'm out giving persuasive speeches. Yeah. You mentioned, or it was mentioned, the Wisconsin uh, program. Do other states have similar uh, proposals already in place, or? programs in place that we're modeling this after or the question is are there other states that have similar things uh, there are other states that have made PERS and PED well PED is reportable on a national level but there are other states as I understand it that have made PERS reportable so that if it's identified as a positive in a diagnostic lab that has to be reported that's pretty much on a statewide basis and I don't know of anybody else besides Wisconsin that uh, is requesting or requiring the status of imported pigs. Any, you have any other ideas on that, Dave? No, I'm not aware of any. Either. No. Um, and obviously, uh, Canada has some pretty uh, significant restrictions when, of pigs coming into them, particularly with PED. And I don't know if there's got a restriction with PERS as well, but. Just PED. Two biggest deals with Canada are PED and super rabies, which basically is eradicated, but we still got some within the wild pigs. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so no, we, uh, um, again, Minnesota would, in this situation, would, <clears throat> would be a leader, I think, you know, in, in uh, uh, taking another step. All right. Um, any other uh, comments? What time we got here? Oh, 5 to 10. Look at that. We consume the hour. And I let you go early. Always like you, you, you always want to end a meeting with people wanting to come back. Thank you for attention. You can corner me on the way out if you like. And uh, we look forward to your uh, input and responses.